Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday evening prayer time and Bible study. I hope that you are somewhere wrapped up in a blanket, sipping on some hot chocolate, and settled in on this cold and icy Wednesday evening. Well, maybe not too settled in. I don't want you to fall asleep, so maybe don't wrap up too tightly, but I hope you're warm and safe somewhere. Uh, I don't think it's too much behind the music to say that we record this a little bit earlier on Wednesday, and so we're in between the two waves of weather coming through at this point. Uh, but I hope tonight you are somewhere safe and warm and will stay that way overnight and that God will bless us perhaps with more snow than ice as we go into this evening. A few things for you to think about as we go into the next week. Next Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. And we will have a virtual Ash Wednesday service uh, available here at the same time and place uh, as every Wednesday evening. We'll have some of the other staff participating in that. It will be much like Ash Wednesday observances of the past, uh, with the exception that we, we obviously won't be imposing ashes during that service, as is your tradition. Um, but we will give you an opportunity to reflect on that, think about that uh, as we begin Lent together. Speaking of Lent, we do have our Lenten devotion books available. Uh, a lot of those are picked up Sunday, but we do still have some more available. They will be available this Sunday. You could call the office and we will get one to you. They also will be available online as a PDF. And they are really fantastic. We had 40 contributing writers from the congregation who did a, a, just a wonderful job. And our staff put those together for you. And uh, I think they'll be a very helpful resource through this season, so I hope you will get one and make use of it. I should say, a few people have asked, they are free, uh, we're not charging for them, and if you paid Hank Ellington when he delivered one to you, you should get your money back, so just want to make sure you know that. But for everybody else, they are free, and we hope you'll take one and make use of it. Uh, also, as we look toward weeks to come, on the 21st, we will have some opportunities for in-person Sunday school. We have five large group open classes for adults, and then for children and youth, we'll have classes for those who attend with their parents. And registration for those classes begins on Monday. And what we're going to ask you to do is register on the Monday before the following sur Sunday every week so that we can make sure we're planning appropriately because we do have limited capacity. We still can't have a lot of people even in large rooms, and so we want to be careful about that. But we will have five different classes. That information is in the weekly update today. Uh, Nikki's written an article to explain all that, spell it out uh, fairly clearly. So I hope you'll take the time to read that and to join us uh, as we do that together. So a lot coming up now as we begin the Lenten season, uh, looking toward Easter. And hopefully as we move that way and as conditions improve in our community, we'll be able to do more and more together. Certainly, uh, that's what we pray. And as we move into our prayer time, uh, we will continue to pray tonight for those who are affected by the pandemic. Um, the encouraging signs, I know, with better numbers, uh, more vaccines getting out there, but we, we need to be diligent to continue to pray. Still folks getting sick, still families who are experiencing the loss of loved ones, still folks who are struggling financially. And that may be several months, maybe even years for recovery in some, some areas. So we want to make sure that we are persistent in praying and, and keeping uh, these folks in our hearts as we pray together. Also, as we experience again another blast of cold weather, I think it's easy for us in our efforts to stay warm, to forget about folks who can't. And so tonight, I would encourage you to pray for those who are looking for shelter tonight, who need a, a warm place to be. I'm thankful for so many ministries in Lexington, Lexington that provide that opportunity, and they open emergency shelters when the weather is bad like this. But uh, remember those folks in your prayers tonight, and think about what God might have you do uh, to help care for the least of these in this difficult time. As we look around the world, sometimes we get so caught up in our own lives, we, we miss significant events around us. I don't know if you've been paying attention over the last week to the events in Myanmar, uh, formerly Burma, and the uh, political upheaval there. 
And uh, I, I pay close attention to that because we have friends who are there and folks that we care about, some, some friends that we had from a previous ministry. And so we want to um, lift them up in prayer and others who are affected by that. And to remember that so often our, uh, the folks who represent us around the world as missionaries find themselves in very difficult places, places that change politically rapidly, places that are affected by all sorts of, of natural disasters or just ongoing poverty. And we forget sometimes how hard their lives can be and how challenging and uh, at times dangerous they can be because of the changes going on around them. So we need to constantly, as we pray for our missionaries, remember uh, those who are in hard and difficult places. And then as always, I encourage you to think about the needs of folks in your family, your neighbors, uh, your workplace, and other Calvary members. Um, remember, our website does have a prayer list there. That's available to you, and we encourage you to go and take a look at that to get caught up on what's going on with other members here at the church and their families. But we will give you a few moments to pray for those needs uh, as we pray together tonight. So let's do that now. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer, giving you a few moments to pray in your own way, and then I'll close our season of prayer together. Let's pray. Gracious and merciful God, we give you thanks this night, even on what is a cold and dreary and potentially dangerous day, we would stop to thank you for every good gift you have given us this day, for a day of life, for a warm place to be, for warm clothes to wear for food, for friends, for people who love us and care about us. God, for all of those gifts tonight, we are truly grateful. And we are mindful that there are others in our community that don't have those same gifts in their life tonight. Those who are without shelter, those who maybe don't have a warm coat or a hot meal. God, we pray that you would care for them, that you would provide for them, and that you would help us to know how we can care for them and be a part of your provision. And we continue to pray for folks affected by the pandemic, we pray for recovery for those who are sick, for strength for those who are recovering. For so many, that is such a long process. For comfort for those who are mourning the loss of their loved ones. And for your provision, again, for those who are suffering through economic distress. And God, we, we are encouraged and we are grateful for the good signs that we see. But we would remain diligent and persistent in our prayers for those who are affected. And for all of us, O oh God, who just are living lives with a certain level of stress. 
all the time. We pray that through this, we would learn how to depend upon you more fully, trust in your grace more completely, so that we might know, we might know that you're at work in our lives. God, as we think about not just our lives, but lives around the world, we realize that there are people serving your kingdom today in hard places, places that are dangerous, places that are difficult because of the circumstances in the community where they are, places that just have challenges that we don't even really begin to appreciate. And so we pray tonight, oh God, a special blessing on those who are representing us and you in the hard places around the world. And God, we forget sometimes that you came into a very hard place. Born in a manger, living life often on the margins. And as we continue to read the gospel tonight, I think, God, it's, it's so easy for us to overlook that your love and your grace and your mercy incarnated was rejected by those who claim to be your children. What an incredible thing to think. God, help us not to be like that. Help us not to reject your grace and mercy and your compassion simply because we don't like the container in which it comes in our lives. Help us to be open to where you're at work in our world today. And maybe as we read your word again tonight, we'll will gain fresh insight, a new way of seeing so that we might understand what you're doing around us even now. So continue with us. May your spirit teach us as we engage your word together. For to Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, we come tonight to the 12th chapter of the gospel according to John, and as we do that, we're, we're kind of at a seam in John's gospel. Now, it's not necessarily a, a dramatic just shift. We'll talk about kind of what's happening here as we go along, but it is a seam. We're moving out of the book of signs, these events that have happened in in the ministry of Jesus that Jesus has interpreted and, and tried to put in context for us, this process that we've been in for moving to seeing leads to believing and as we saw last week belief leads to seeing and we're going to see kind of one final movement of that in the chapter tonight and we're moving out of that now into the book of the passion into that final week of the life of Christ and so chapter 12 becomes that that is that seam it's that transition point moving from one to the other moving out of that last sign which is the raising of Lazarus into the beginning of the passion as Jesus enters Jerusalem and Holy Week begins and tonight what I want us to do is look at these um, vignettes really because that's what they are in the 12th chapter these are kind of different scenes but they're threaded together. They're still dealing with the themes we've been dealing with through the book of, si through the, book of the signs. It's see, seeing and believing and the revelation of God and the glory of God that's, that's being revealed in Christ. All of those themes are still here. In many ways, this is a culmination of a lot of that thematic material that we've been um, looking at as we've gone through. So I want us to spend some time reflecting on that, but also thinking about how it sets up what's coming in the passion of Christ. So let's look at the 12th chapter and we're just going to take it kind of a scene at a time tonight as we go. Instead of reading through the whole chapter, we'll kind of take one scene at a time and spend a little time uh, talking about what each one has to say to us. So John 12, beginning in the first verse, 
Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why doesn't the perfume, why wasn't the perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. All right, let's stop here for a minute. This is kind of the first scene in the 12th chapter. And as we end that, my first thought is, poor Lazarus. I mean, all Lazarus did was die already, raised from the dead, and now the Jews want to kill him just because he was raised from the dead. I, Lazarus can't catch a break here, but... And uh, if you were with us last week, we talked about that whole uh, Eugene O'Neill writing about you know, Lazarus laughed. It's a great piece if you want to go back and, and read that. So I do feel a little bit sorry for Lazarus, I guess. And, and it's still that story that we're dealing with here in the first vignette. I know there's a transition at the beginning of the 12th chapter, but, but John's still telling that story, right? He's, he's still... We're still in that mode of coming out of 11 into 12. And this is one of those places where the chapter um, delineations really don't help us much because we're still dealing with the same story. Now some time has passed and Jesus has now really come back. And he's coming back to Jerusalem for the festival. He's coming back to Jerusalem for the Passover. And it's six days before the Passover, John tells us. Now, this is a point of uh, interest to New Testament scholars particularly because when you compare John's gospel to the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it appears that they're shifted just the least little bit in the fact that John is a day different from the synoptics. Now, there, I think there's a reason for that in John, and we're going to talk about that more when we get to toward the end of the Passion Week itself and what John's interest is here and the way he tells the story. I don't think, actually, that the events happened in a different sequence. So I want to make that clear. But there, in the way he tells the story, there's some symbolic significance, particularly related to the Passover, that John is making that not quite as important to the synoptics. And remember, here again, John is interpreting the story of Jesus. He, he, the synoptic stories were kind of already out there in circulation. John is not reporting the story of Jesus in the same way they are. He really is interpreting it. He's trying to make meaning of it. And so he's careful to connect it to symbolic references. Think now back about the book of the science. How many times has what Jesus was doing or what Jesus was saying been connected to a particular feast or festival or event in the life of Israel? Well, here it is again. And, and all of the events going forward now into the passion of the Christ and even his resurrection are connected to the festival of the Passover and God's deliverance of Israel. And we're to see that. We're going to see other small connections of that through the story tonight. But that's the backdrop. Like the last conversation when Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, the backdrop was the feast of, you know, of what we know as Hanukkah, the feast of dedication. Now what's about to happen is all over the, the context of the feast of the Passover. So here again we find John setting not only um, the kind of historic timeline, but also setting here a symbolic theological context for what Jesus will do. And he's gone to Bethany, 
which we already know is where Lazarus and Mary and Martha live. It's so he's gone back there. It's a suburb of Jerusalem, if you will. And he's gone to the house of Lazarus, which John reminds us, although he doesn't need to because it just happened, but he does, that he's the one who Jesus raised from the dead. And he's going to repeat that at the end of the chapter. But, so John wants us to make sure that we understand that what's happening now is connected to that story that that's still what we're dealing with here. And I want you to try, if you can, to just soak this in for a moment. Now, we know this story. You've read this story probably a, a hundred times, if not maybe a thousand. And we know it so well that if, if we're not careful, we can miss the moment itself. So here we have Jesus sitting in the house of his good friends, sitting with Lazarus, who was dead, 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 four days dead, whom Jesus has called out of the grave, has come back to life. Jesus has been through that cycle of mourning and rejoicing with them. Mary and Martha and all their friends have mourned and rejoiced again, and now they're having a meal together. They're sitting there reclined, having a meal. Martha's serving. She's back to doing what she does. She's, she's preparing the meal. She's bringing it out. And think about them kind of reclined, laying a little bit on their side around a low table, covered in, in bread and fruit and wine. And it's all laid out there before them. And they're ready to eat. And Mary comes out. And Mary goes over to Jesus, and she gently lowers herself down to her knees. And perhaps she pulls a, a towel around her waist, and she slowly uncovers the feet of Jesus. And she breaks the top off of a jar of perfume. Um, delicate we don't we don't get the alabaster jar description here that we find other places in the synoptic gospels but we know that this is a valuable almost uh, too valuable some would say perfume and she snips off the thin neck of that bottle and she begins to wipe the feet of Jesus with her hair and she pours the perfume on his feet. What do you smell in that moment? You know, can you can you smell that perfume? I I don't know why, but I've always thought it would smell like lavender. I don't know why, but that's that's the smell that comes to mind for me. And as that perfume fills the room and it mixes with the smell of the food, I can imagine the whole place just gets dead silent. And they watch as Mary does this incredibly intimate thing. And she washes the feet of her teacher. Work normally assigned to a servant. And we see this juxtaposition of, of Mary taking her hair, which Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians is the glory of a woman, right? And wiping the most inglorious part of Jesus' body, the dirty, filthiest part of his body of people who walk around with just sandals on in the dust. And you can imagine the responses around the room. Some who are confused. Some who are in shock. Some who are moved to tears. Some who realize, oh, maybe Mary's doing this as a gift to Jesus because of what she did or what he did for her brother. Some who wonder if Mary knows something they don't know. And at least one indignant response from Judas, whom John obviously has no use for whatsoever, Judas the embezzler, Judas the betrayer, Judas whose opinion is pushed out the door immediately because he didn't have a genuine concern. 
all of those responses in the room. Only one of them spoken. Everyone just entranced with what's going on before them. And Mary, oblivious to all of it, giving Jesus this extravagant gift, this extravagant expression of her love and devotion. Just take that in for a minute. Before we get to what it means, and it just... Just take that moment in for a minute. Put yourself in that room, sitting around the table. What an incredible experience. What that must have felt like to Mary, what it must have felt like to Jesus. And so he interprets it for everyone else. Sensing probably the variety of responses around him, he interprets it. And certainly in response to what Judah says, he says, leave her be. Leave her be. It was intended that she would save this perfume for the day of my burial. You see, there's a connection here around the concept of anointing. If we look back to 1 Samuel 10, 1, and Saul goes and anoints, or Samuel goes and anoints Saul, there's this idea of anointing oil and perfume, and the, the, the nard that is referenced here was often used in the anointing of kings. And so here, instead of Samuel pouring the oil, the nard on Saul's head, Mary pours it, pours it on Jesus' feet. But nevertheless, she is anointing him. She's anointing the one that will be proclaimed very shortly in the story as the coming king. But Mary seems to get the kind of king he will be. And Jesus says, no, what she's doing is preparing for my burial. She's anointing me for what I must now endure. And then he adds a note at the end there, which has caused people problems for years. He says, you know, the poor you will always have with me. I'm only with you for a little while. Just because we always have the poor with us doesn't mean we should ignore the poor. I've heard that used far too often in my lifetime for people who said, no, the poor are always there. And whether or not we use the, the aphorism from Jesus, taking Jesus out of context absolutely here, whether or not we use that or we're just using the, the idea that you can never overcome such a large problem to be an excuse for not trying to address it, Jesus' intent here was not to let us off the hook of caring for the least of these. So let's set that aside. That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is in this moment, she is giving me the only gift she can. And it's an extravagant gift. And for us in our own discipleship, I wonder sometimes if we're hesitant to give Jesus the extravagant gift. If in our own minds we have this conversation with ourselves of, well, there are other things we need to do. There are other ways we need to act. There are other things I need to spend my money on. Whatever it may be, whether it's time or talent or treasure or whatever, I have all these other commitments. And they're important too. But maybe there are those moments, those special moments, when we need to give Jesus the extravagant gift, where there's something that God has set aside in our lives that was meant to be an expression of our love and devotion to Jesus. And that's what Mary's doing here. Now, it becomes an occasion for some conflict because it says, meanwhile, back at the ranch, there's a large crowd of Jews who found out that Jesus was there and they came out to see him. But they also came out to see Lazarus. Why? 
because he's the story. The man who is dead is now alive. And so the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus, poor Lazarus. Now, as we think about how this story fits into this overall narrative from the book of the signs into the book of the passion, we talked about last week how there's been this progression between seeing in order to believe, and then when we get to Martha, we get you know, belief that allows you to see. But what we have here with Mary is the ultimate expression of that, kind of the the maturation of all of that process where it comes to the point where she acts on what she believes before she could see it. Martha see or believes and then sees because she believes. Mary takes that another step further. She actually acts on what she believes before she could see it. The whole point of what Mary does here is that Mary gets it. Somehow, she has some sense of what's happening with Jesus. She may not understand it completely, and she may not have seen it all yet, certainly, but she believes who Jesus is, and so she acts proactively about, in response to what she believes about who Jesus is before she has the opportunity to see what it all means. And as we see a little bit later in the chapter, that's what faith really is, is, is about. That's what the disciples begin to understand over time, that it's as they act on what they believe, then they will see what has happened. And they'll see the confirmation of that. And that's what we see here with Mary. Then we move into the next vignette that seems to flow in John's gospel fairly organically out of the last one. Beginning in verse 12, the next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So people are gathering for Passover. They're coming, they're making their pilgrimage to Passover. And they had heard that Jesus was coming in. They took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that, he had performed this sign went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. So this is the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. This is Palm Sunday, right? Jesus is making his way into Jerusalem. And as he's coming, the crowd is excited. They're, they're looking forward to him coming. And so they grab palm branches. This has a couple of, of references. There's reference in the Psalms to that. But there's also a tie back here again to that story of the Maccabean revolt and the palm branch being a sign of victory from that era. And so they're waving that palm branch in an expectation that Jesus is coming to deliver them. In the same way that the Maccabeans delivered them from the Syrians, now Jesus is coming to deliver them from the Romans. And maybe even also from those who are affiliated with the Romans, which is what makes all the, the temple higher-ups anxious. And they come out and they greet him with, Hosanna, save us. And to call out to Jesus, save us, means they believe he can do so. That he, that's what he is coming to do. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is from Psalm 118, which is a Hallel psalm, which is a psalm that was used in, uh, for, as the pilgrims made their way to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And so he is, there, the, or the crowd is, using this language related, it's intermingled from their history of deliverance and the deliverance of God from the Passover that they're coming to celebrate. All this is mingling together now and being applied to Jesus. 
Now, we should say that blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord was used for pilgrims as they came. Blessed are all of you who come in the name of the Lord to celebrate the festival. But this is being applied to Jesus differently. This is being applied to Jesus as a coming Savior, Deliverer, and as it says in the next line, blessed is the King of Israel. These are the folks who want to pour the nard on Jesus' head and not his feet. And that's going to cause some trouble later in the week. They're welcoming Jesus, but they don't really know what Jesus is coming to do. They're welcoming Jesus based on what they hope he will do for them, how they hope he will respond to them. And it tells us that Jesus found a cult which fulfills the prophecy of uh, Zechariah 9.9, 9, where he says, don't be afraid daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. And so here Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. Now John gives us an interesting editorial note here. At first his disciples did not understand. It was only after he was glorified did they understand how it fit together. And we begin to get some insight, we'll see it again later in the chapter, about how the early church learned to read the Hebrew scriptures. It wasn't that they saw it coming, that they apprehended what, oh yes, this is what the prophet said, this is what the prophet said. It wasn't in real time that they got that. It's not like the disciples are following Jesus in Jerusalem and the crowds are there and, you know, Thomas looks at Bartholomew and says, hey, this is Zechariah 9.9, just like we thought it would be. No, it's only after, when they look back, that they begin to understand and that the Spirit begins to teach them, as we learn in the book of Acts, how the Scriptures led up to what happens in Jesus. They don't know it now. This is, this is reflection. Again, John is making meaning of the story. And part of how he's helping us understand the meaning of who Jesus is and what he's doing is by tying what's happening back to what the prophets said would happen. And all the gospel writers do that because it's, it's absolutely crucial to their understanding of how God was at work through Jesus. This is not a new story. This is a continuation of the story that begins in creation. And so they're saying, no, this is exactly what God had planned all along. This is a fulfillment of the promise through the prophets. And so even here in the detail like Jesus riding on a donkey, they said, no, that's what the prophet said in Zechariah. So it's a, this, in, this connection is important, but it happens after the fact. It's not happening in real time. It's happening after the fact. The crowd that was with him, some of the same crowd, that was there to see what happened with Lazarus. Of course it was. He's coming in from Bethany. They followed him in from Bethany, and they're telling the story. You won't believe what this guy did in Bethany. They're telling the story to other people, and it's getting the crowd more and more worked up, more and more excited, and that makes the Pharisees and the other leaders more and more uncomfortable. And they said, look, this is getting out of hand. This, this plan we've had to wait and see what happens is getting us nowhere this is getting out of hand. The whole world is going after him. Slight hyperbole, but nevertheless, that's the way they saw it in the moment. And so Jesus is now entering into Jerusalem. The passion is beginning. Uh, verse 20, now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it and said it thundered, and others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, 
This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. You know, it's an interesting little story because as it begins, there are some folks who want to see Jesus. And as it ends, Jesus hid himself. And I've always thought that at the end of that little episode that Andrew and Philip must have been standing there as Jesus went away and said, so is that a no on the meeting with the Greeks or you don't want to see them? Because Jesus doesn't ever really address that. In fact, it becomes the occasion for Jesus to say, okay, that part of my ministry is over this part is beginning, and that's what we see happening here. This is the seam itself between the book of the signs and the book of the passion. So just to back up a minute, there's some Greeks who were coming to the, to the festival, and perhaps you're thinking, wait a minute, Greeks were not Jews. No, but there were Greek-speaking Hellenized Jews at times and others who were not converted to Judaism, but were what we call God-fearers. They would come and worship in the synagogue. They had not made the full conversion, but nevertheless were faithful in their worship and their study. And so these these probably are what we're talking about here, some some God-fearers, some Greeks who were interested in what Jesus was up to. And so they came to the disciple who probably himself was Hellenist because his name is a Hellenized name, Philip. They're from Bethsaida, which was on that area where there at least would have been a mix. And so they, they thought, okay, well, this is our connection. So they go to Philip. Philip gets Andrew. They go to Jesus and say, there's some folks who want to see you. And, of course, Jesus doesn't respond to their invitation directly. Instead, he says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And that's, this is the scene. You remember how the book of signs started in John 2. Jesus at the wedding of Cana. They'd run out of wine. Jesus' mother goes, do something about that. He says, woman, my time has not yet come. Throughout the book of signs, what have we heard over and over and over again? The time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. It is not yet time. We've heard that repeated, repeated, repeated. Now what does Jesus say? The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. It is time for me to do what I've come to do. And what I've come to do is to die to bring new life. And that's the metaphor here. A kernel of wheat falls to the ground and it dies. It remains only a single seed. But if it dies, if it it doesn't die, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. In other words, I have I've now come to do what I've got to do. I've I've got to die. And there are multiple metaphors for that in this passage. I've got to complete my work. The time has come. The time for what I was doing is now over. It is time for me to be glorified. And then Jesus says, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. I think this is actually Jesus' answer to Philip and Andrew. If they want to see me, it's not about seeing me anymore. The signs are over. It's not about seeing me, spending time. Now it's time to follow me. It's time for me to do what I have to do, and if you want to be with me now, you're going to have to follow me where I go. And if you want to keep your life, don't come with me. If you want to have life and you're willing to lose your life now to have life, eternal life, then come with me. This is the call to discipleship that we find earlier in the other Gospels. We find expressed here in John's Gospel. At the critical moment, he looks at Philip and Andrew and says, 
they don't want to just see me now. I don't want to just see people now. If you want to be with me, you're going to have to follow me, and that's going to cost you your life. You're going to have to be willing to give up everything if you want to be with me. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be, and my father will honor the one who serves me. And that's where the life comes from. That God then gives life for those who give up their lives in order to follow Jesus. My soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. These are the words we're accustomed to hearing in Gethsemane, right? But this is why I came. Father, glorify. And then heaven responds. I have glorified. What does that mean? God's been glorifying God's name all along. That's what the signs were all about. Jesus said that over and over again. I've just come to do the work of my Father so that my Father will be glorified. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. And the crowd heard it. But to some extent like thunder, to some extent like angelic speech. And Jesus said, that's for your benefit. I don't need it, I know. But that's so that you know that what's about to happen is what God sent me to do. And it's so that God will be glorified. He said, this is what's going to bring judgment on the world. Whether or not how you decide about me and what you see happen next, how you respond to that is what's going to be, it's going to be uh, what brings judgment. And he says in verse 32, and I, when I am lifted up, Remember what he told Nicodemus in his encounter? All of these themes from early in the gospel are all coming together now, right? All of the book of the signs, all of those themes are all weaving together now to bring us into the passion of Christ. When I will be lifted up from the earth, I will draw people to myself. Now, a question that to me is an open question that I've never really spent the time to research much and look back, but it's one, one of these days, <laughs> kind of projects. But it's interesting to me the connection here between Jesus and the story of, of the serpent being lifted up in the wilderness and what it means to connect Jesus with that serpent. Um, not sure what to do with that, I'm going to be honest. But that, to me, that's an interesting question of the salvation that's offered. But in both cases, what it points to is the, the people's willingness to look to something to trust in God. And so what I think it means, completely unresearched, I just want to give you that caveat. This is the, the gospel according to Monty right now. But what I think it means is there was such scandal in the early days of the church over the fact that that Jesus as the Messiah was crucified. It was an incredibly scandalous thing. We find even in the, the New Testament letters this scandalon stumbling block uh, mentioned that is the stumbling block of the crucifixion itself because it was considered such a scandalous thing that the idea that people would look to something scandalous, a serpent in the wilderness, the Son of Man on the cross, meant that they had to look past that to see the provision of God, that what, what they were really seeing was this heinous thing on its face, but it represented God's deliverance. And they had to be willing to look through that to see God's deliverance. And I think what happens here in this, in this imagery is that Jesus is saying, you remember how they had to look through the serpent, the very thing that was... Um, troubling them they had to look at that in order to receive the deliverance of God that now you have to look at me the very thing that's troubling you in some ways to see how God is at work delivering I think that's what's going on here um, it requires more study and more thought but I, I think that's that's what's happening here but nonetheless he says this so that they will understand what's about to happen that he's about to be crucified the crowd doesn't like that We've heard from the law that we're, the Messiah will remain forever. In other words, you're supposed to come, deliver us, set up the kingdom of God on the mountain of Zion. The lion will dwell with the lamb and all those things that the prophet Isaiah said. All that's going to come true, right? That's why you're here. Jesus said, no, that's not what I came to do. How can the Son of Man be lifted up? In other words, if you're coming to die, that's not what we're looking for, Jesus. 
You're not the kind of Messiah we want to see. Jesus said, you're only going to have the light a little bit longer. I'm only going to be here to help you with this for a little while. You need to learn to walk in the light while it's here, before the darkness overtakes you. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of the light. And those were his last words in that moment, and he hid himself. Then the final kind of passage here, beginning with verse 37, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. That's the bottom line of the book of signs. Jesus did so many things, and they still wouldn't believe. And as they look back on it, as John looks back on it, through the inspiration of the Spirit, he says, this is what the prophet said would happen. From Isaiah 53, Lord who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. For this reason they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere, as Isaiah 6.10, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so that they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. You remember the context of Isaiah 6? where that second part there comes from, Isaiah 6.10. Isaiah 6 is in the the year that King Uzziah died. I saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated on throne in the temple. Remember, it's the vision of Isaiah. And this is beautiful interaction between God and Isaiah. And and Isaiah says, whoa, not me. I'm I'm a man with unclean lips. I come from a people of unclean lips. And God cleanses and sends him out with a message. But what is his task, you remember? His task is go out and preach, but they won't listen to you. Take them my message, but they won't understand it. And so John here says, oh, that's what Isaiah 6 is about. God would come, reveal God's self to to the people, and they wouldn't understand it. They won't get it. He says, Isaiah knew this. Why? Because he saw the glory of the Lord. He saw the glory of the Lord. He saw Jesus' glory, it's the same glory of God in the temple, and he spoke about him. Early Christians would come to understand that they could only interpret the Hebrew scriptures in the light of their experience with Jesus and the revelation of God they found in Jesus. And so they would begin to read the Hebrew scriptures through the lens of the teachings and life of Jesus. And even today, you know, the the old language in the 1963 Baptist Faith and Message said that all Scripture is to be interpreted through the criterion of Jesus Christ, that it's through the lens of Christ that we understand what's happening in the Scripture. And the early church did that, and that's what John's doing here. He's bringing forward the words of the prophet to apply them to what happened in the life of Jesus, and in this case, to explain why people didn't all get it. They, they didn't understand why everybody didn't accept it, why everybody didn't get it. They knew it had something to do often with the scandal of the cross and some others who simply weren't willing to give up what they had, their position, their power, their place, whatever, in order to follow Jesus. And so a lot of this is trying to understand what the reality was after the resurrection of Christ. Yet at the same time, many among the leaders believed in him there were some but because of the pharisees they wouldn't openly acknowledge their faith in fear they'd be put out of the synagogue for they loved human praise more than praise from god that's still true isn't it folks who are afraid to live out their faith because of what others might think what others might say verse 44 then jesus cried out whoever believes in me does not believe in me only then the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as light so that no one believes in me should stay in darkness. This is an interweaving of, of two themes, the theme of light and darkness that we've been with all along, but this theme that will be really central to Jesus' upper room discourse with the disciples of if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We're going to get that response to a question from Philip a little bit later. And so Jesus is is bringing these thoughts together. Verse 47, if anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person for I did not come to judge the world but to save the world. 
There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day, for I did not speak on my own. But the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. These are kind of Jesus' closing arguments before we get into the events of the passion themselves. I've come to do what I was sent to do. I've said what I was told to say, and now I'm going to finish my work. And what you decide about me, it won't be up to me to judge you. But the one who sent me will judge you based on how you respond to me. That's what he's telling them. And again, part of, part of what's going on here later in the gospel itself and as the early church gathers is they're trying to understand this, this mixed response to Jesus. And they, they, they don't know what to do with it. They can't grasp why some people would accept and others wouldn't. And so they go back to the words of Jesus and they remind themselves, well, this is what he said it would be. He said some would follow, some would be willing to give up everything. Some wouldn't. And we find explanations of that in the other Gospels. You know, the, the narrow path and the narrow gate and all of those parables about the kingdom where, you know, the wheat and the tares and the fish and all of those parables that talk about how it all gets sorted out in the end that God eventually will be the one to sort it out. But the criterion is how do you respond to what Jesus has done? Do you obey the commands? Do you follow the life? Do you lay aside your own life for the sake of the life that Jesus would give you? He says that is indeed the bottom line. And so now we're getting into that last week of, of Christ and all of the imagery that we find there. Much of the book of the signs in terms of volume of chapters is in this upper room discourse. And we'll begin that um, in, the, you know, in the 13th chapter and the beautiful passages that that are there and we'll spend some time on that during the Lenten season. I think that's an appropriate place for us to be uh, during Lent. Uh, now reminder next week is our Ash Wednesday service and so I hope you will join us for that as a way to begin our Lenten observation together. Again thank you for being with us tonight. Let's pray together. Oh God you revealed yourself to us in Christ you revealed your glory. And we know that Christ was lifted up. And when we look to him, we are delivered. And when we follow him, we follow him, yes, through the cross, but also into the resurrection. But as we begin in the next week, the journey of Lent, Perhaps we need to stay on this side of the cross for a bit to contemplate again who we are before you and to be reminded of our need for the grace of Christ. And maybe, God, if we're honest, More often than not, we choose to hold back. We choose to live life our way, not always offering the extravagant gift that you would call for, not always living life fully in obedience to your command. And so we pray in this season that is to come that you would help us to, to learn again through the disciplines of the season to, to follow you closely, to be attentive to what you are doing, to learn to, to see where you're at work. So God, we pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts to experience you in a fresh way in this Lenten season. For all these things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Good night.